Hinduism is um, it's the third largest religion in the world. So there's Christianity, um, Islam, Hinduism. Um, so it would be the third largest religion in the world. 1.2 billion Hindus, which is um, half of the number of Christians. So uh, they say there's 2.4 billion Christians in the world. Um, Hinduism is considered to be one of the oldest religions in human history, and and so we're going to kind of talk about like what that um, what that really means, I guess, in the sense you, you can't really define Hindu. Hinduism, um, uh, and, and you'll kind of see what I mean as we go, but um, one thing to consider as we look into this Eastern religion, this Eastern ideal of um, a formal religion, is the central idea is that the, the solution is within, okay? that in and of yourself you can work your way into being um, have or just good works in general okay it's it's all about a state of consciousness that in and of yourself you're going to think your way out of um, all of the negativity and all these different things right and so this idea is where uh, and, and so this is kind of what I, I want you to think the idea this idea is where many of the self-help programs and practices stem from okay you guys are going to be really familiar with one version or one branch of hinduism which is practiced here in in western culture called yoga okay there's one particular group the the tm is what they call it the transcendental meditation the transcendental meditation group um, it's mainly focused on on yoga uh, so that's one that's one thing that kind of resonates that stems from from, uh, Hinduism. Um, it's an old age religion that has manifested itself in new forms throughout the century. So um, th this, this way that they think, um, you know, think yourself into positive things, think yourself out of negativity is really a big new age religion in, um, in the Western culture today, in, the, in like the United States, right? There are literally Christian branches, I wouldn't even call them Christian, but they claim to be Christian, that have merged with a lot of the way Hindus think, okay? It's almost like a Christian Hinduism or something, okay? Um, quick facts. There is no single Hindu idea of God. There is no single uh, single Hindu idea of God. They literally have 303 million gods. Okay, so they'll have a God for every situation, every circumstance, every practice, everything, right? Um, because there's no way that it, it's, so I was watching this video the other day and a guy, and I, I didn't know this, but um, you guys are familiar with Star Wars. And apparently, it's one of the best movies you can ever watch in your entire lifetime. Please watch Star Wars. But uh, turns out uh, Sir George Lucas, the um, author and originator of the Star Wars saga, he was influenced by, I think his name was Joseph Campbell. Don't, don't hold me to that. But he was uh, influenced by uh, a Hindu, Joseph Campbell, who, and where he got the idea of the force is within you. So you guys know Yoda, which is very similar to yoga. And, um, and so when Yoda tells Luke to trust the force that, that's within him, there's, there's this one single idea of everything is God creation, everything outside of creation, your thoughts, everything, God exists in all things, okay? Um, all souls are eternal and accountable for their own actions. Karma, you guys have heard of karma, right? Karma is the debt of one's bad actions for which one must atone. Does anything stick out when I say that to you guys? You must atone for your own bad actions. 
Huh? Yeah, it's workspace, but, but also the idea of Christianity is that God had atoned for our sins through the sacrifice of Christ, right? And so uh, instead of God doing the works, they believe, they, they, uh, they believe that you must atone for your own sins. And we'll kind of talk about how here in a minute. Um, Hinduism replaces resurrection with reincarnation. So these are things that you're kind of familiar with or you terms that you've heard before, but um, I, I think what's important is to identify that uh, one, this is a very old religion. It's Eastern thought on religion. Okay, so primarily India and in that, that part of the world. Um, and um, there is no one God, no one authority that God exists in all things. Um, okay, Th there, and, and that's even hard too because um, in Hinduism, there's so many branches of Hinduism, Hinduism simply because their, their idea of God and creation and all these things is more about just ideas than it is rooted in, well, Catholics believe this and Christians believe this. Okay, so remember what we've been doing since we started is every religion that we uh, explore or that we try to understand, the two main questions are what? Who's got that so far? Who Jesus is and what is their authority? And so what's interesting about Hinduism is there is no authority that you are essentially your own authority, okay? Um, Hinduism or Eastern religious influences didn't grow in America society until like the late 60s and 70s. That's probably not a surprise. That's back when John was about 40 and that's when all the hippies and stuff were around and and so some of that flower power and stuff all kind of started coming in and uh, the Beatles, yeah, the Beatles were uh, strongly influenced by Hinduism. Uh, not just the Beatles, uh, there was another band because I'd seen that too. But anyways, all that to say the Hindu concept of God has deep roots within many cults today and has blended with other mainstream religions. And the reason is, is because you, you can't, um, the reason is, is because it is an idea or a concept of essentially a religious view, a worldview. It's not, well, we believe this particular uh, being or person is God. So there's no founder necessarily of Hinduism. So uh, Islam would have Muhammad, Jehovah's Witnesses have uh, Charles Hayes Russell, Mormons have Joseph Smith. There is no necessarily uh, like a founder or a prophet of Hinduism, okay? This is more about practicing uh, old age Eastern um, religion in the sense that there is a concept of God, but God can be in almost anything and everything. Okay. So for uh, thousands of years now, they've literally been worshiping uh, different gods, 303 million different gods, right? What, um, what I want to do uh, this evening is I want to focus on the three well-known Hindu, Hindu groups in American society. Okay. I'm going to narrow those down to the Rajneeshism, Rajneeshism, the International Society for Krishna, Krishna Consciousness, more, uh, more fam familiarly known as Hare Krishnas, and the Transcendental Med Meditation, also called TM. Okay, those are the three main, you guys are familiar with Hare Krishnas, y'all know what that is? They wear the, um, they have huh? They have, shaved. they have shaved, yeah, but they have a ponytail. And there's a reason they have a ponytail. I watched a, a thing on it the other day. They have a ponytail to protect them from something. But anyways, uh, they have the little um, uh, ponytail. The Rajneeshism, has, has anybody heard about him? Raj, Rajneesh? Um, there is, and I'm going to mention it here in a minute, but there is a documentary or, or maybe a short film on Netflix, Netflix yeah. yeah, called Wild Wild Country. Wild, wild country. Seriously, you have to watch that, okay? Um, 
and Rajneesh, and we're, we're going to talk about him. But um, so Hinduism is said to be over 5,000 years old and would have originated during a similar timeline of Abraham and Moses, okay? Uh, and that shouldn't be a surprise, right? It shouldn't be a surprise because, um, you know, after Noah comes Abraham, but in Genesis chapter 11 is the Tower of Babel where God separates all of mankind and they all scatter across the world and they all, they're all worshiping different gods, okay? Even at the Tower of Babel, they're still all worshiping different gods. But, um, and, and so that shouldn't surprise you and shouldn't do, because the question would be, well, in relation to Judaism, what would this mean? Well, Adam and Eve was created and then you have a timeline up to, say, Ab uh, Noah and then Abraham. Well, um, Hinduism would have originated in that timeline, okay? So, because there were other people in the world, on the earth, they scattered at the Tower of Babel and they were all worshiping other gods. So that shouldn't be something that would make you think, well, oh, is that in competition with Judaism? No, it, it's uh, Judaism would still, um, be the source of where even Hinduism came from, okay? The word Hindu itself is not an Indian word, but it derives from the Indus River. The Indus River, which is actually, uh, it was designated, the name had been designated from the uh, Persian Empire. Uh, because the Indus, Indus River run through Persia, right? Uh, one famous Hindu is quoted saying, all Hindu sects appear different but would all say they are different interpretations divided but of the one eternal religion in India. Okay, so the, you can't have enemies, so there's not a problem. It's not like Islam where if you, ha if you don't agree on the same uh, uh, religious views in regards to um, the Sunnis, the Shiites, and all them, um, then, then that's okay. That's okay because uh, Hindus would also say that all religions are true and all gods are gods. So they don't have a problem with us and they don't have a problem with one another. It's more about, um, it, it's such an open view to the idea of God and how um, God should be worshiped in, in, in a person's life, right? Um, so their scripture, okay, their scripture. Now here, here's something to keep in mind. They probably, I was looking at a list of it the other day, they probably have, uh, if you were to, if I was to say sacred writings, sacred writings, they probably have somewhere between 30 to 50 different sacred, sacred writings. So to put that in perspective, that would be like us having 30 to 50 different Bibles. Okay, uh, there is no one book that is the final authority. There are some that they focus on more, and I'm going to share it with you here in a minute. But it is something to kind of keep in mind when you think about this. Um, their main scriptures were written and collected around the last half of the second millennium BC. So somewhere uh, 1500 BC before Christ, right? Um, the writings that they would would claim to to say would, would you know came earlier than all the other ones, and uh, they would probably focus on the most are known as the Vedas, is what they call them. It's kind of the wisdom or knowledge. Uh, the concluding portions of the Vedas are called the Upanishads. I think that's how you say it, which are the Vedic the Vedic teachings of the beliefs in pantheism karmic retribution and reincarnation. Pantheism, just so you guys know, is that there are, um, there are many gods, okay? So a pantheist believes that there's really, there's no limit to how many gods there are. You can just say however many gods you want there to be, as long as it's multiple and multiple. So we are a um, monotheistic Trinitarian, 
So we don't say there's many gods. We say there's one God distinct in three persons of nature who's always existed, co-eternal, co-equal, and co-authoritative. Okay, so don't, don't get that confused. One God, three distinct persons. They would say there's thousands, right? 303 million gods, right? So they're pantheistic. And then the karmic retribution is that there is a debt for my, um, my negative thoughts, my negative feelings, my negative actions. Therefore, I have to work my way uh, into good standing. And then obviously reincarnation, that um, you can be reincarnated as an animal, a tree, or anything. Okay, matter of fact, if you live right now and you're breathing, you are currently a reincarnation of, you could have been Adolf Hitler and didn't even know it, right? Uh, but the, the, well, we'll talk more about it here in a minute. All right. The most well known of the Vedas is the Hindu epic that's called the Bhagavad Gita, which tells the story of the warrior prince, prince Arjuna and his charioteer, charioteer Krishna. Krishna is the disguised incarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu. Okay? The Gita, that's a sacred writing, was written down and modified between 200 BC and 200 AD. Different interpretations of this writing leads Hindus to being both pantheistic, in other words, all of existence is in some way divine, and monistic, monistic, not monotheistic, but non monistic. Monistic is that all of existence is one, whether divine or not. Everything is connected. The stars, the wind, the, the people, the animals, everything, okay? Um, contemporary Hinduism, uh, so three basic classifications to which hundreds of Hindu sects can be divided are as follows. As follow. Abstract monist, which is the TM group, Okay. They stress philosophical oneness of the universe as opposed to religious ideas. So they would just say that everything is one. The universe, everything within the universe is all connected. It's just one, right? It sounds really spiritual, but it's demonic. But it, it's oneness, okay? Philosophical oneness of the universe as opposed to a religious idea. The Vishnuites, the Hare Krishnas, who worship in many different manners of the god Vishnu and in many different manifestations as the supreme form of divinity. So they'd be pantheistic, okay? The Shivites are devoted to the worship of the god Shiva as the highest manifestation of divinity, okay? I know this is... I mean, it's unfamiliar. Like once you really start digging into this, it's unfamiliar. And, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting about Hinduism is as much time as I spent looking into it and studying it and researching it, I just don't feel like you can get a pulse on it. There's so many variations and expansions of it. You, you can't narrow it down to like, like we, as a Christian, we can say, well, let's just in all fairness say that the apostles and the people underneath the apostles' teaching was the early New Testament church. Okay, and from there you can go through church history and you could say the apostle John and the apostle James had disciples. And I'm going to get this wrong, but it may have been Polycarp and a couple of, but they had disciples, and then they had disciples, and then they had disciples. Now, sure, there's branches even into the second century where people start going different directions and, and all that stuff. But in reality, we can kind of narrow it down or at least back to what we see in the New Testament. It, in, in Hinduism, there's just no way you can do that because they won't even put a, a parameter on to be Hindu means you have to believe this. Like, even, even in different branches of Christianity, um, we would fellowship with Baptists and Methodists, some, and, uh, and some different other ones because there are some certain close hand core, core beliefs that we would share with them, that Jesus is God, 
right, that the virgin birth occurred and was, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, that He died, He resurrected. We agree on those things. We might baptize different people or people differently. We might do church membership differently, blah, 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 blah. But we're still holding on to those things. In Hinduism, it just doesn't seem like there's much of that at all, right? And it, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing when you start thinking about it. Let's look at some of the Hindu beliefs. God. Again, there's no single idea of God, meaning concepts of deity can include any of the following. We've talked about monism, uh, pantheism, panentheism, that means God is in creation as a soul is in the body. Ananism, God or gods can live in non-human objects such as trees, rocks, animals. Uh, I don't know how familiar you all, you all are with um, Hinduism in the sense that they, they don't eat cows and stuff, right? Like that's, they can't because it might be their cousin who died. Uh, don't chop that tree down because that might be my mom who died. She may have reincarnated as that tree and stuff. So reincarnation is essentially driving that view or that, that belief rather than um, we're just um, hippie uh, earth huggers. It's, it's not that as much as it is. It's, it's more about reincarnation, right? And, and a lot of that's in the animism part of their belief system. All animals or just cows? It's pretty, it can be anything, cat, cow, you name it, aardvark. And then there are, there are some Hindus who are monotheistic, like we are. They would say that there is only one God. So you can kind of see the variation of belief system within it, that, it's, that it kind of, the spectrum is just from one end to the other. Um, so that's technically uh, where they would land on how we think about God. Uh, karma and samsara. Karma, all souls are eternal and accountable for their own actions. Through different Hindu systems, basically works, where one soul escapes the cycle of samsara, where you're reincarnated over and over and over and over again while working their karma off. So the point of being reincarnated is that whatever was not worked off in your previous life, in your new life, now it can be worked off. Because you're trying to atone for this, um, how do you say it, uh, for this state of, of perfect consciousness to be one with the universe. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. The, yes. Yes. Uh, it is the state of, of, of consciousness that's perfect, I, I guess, where you're one with, you're now one with the universe. You're escaping the cycle of reincarnation to go back and be with the one, or what, the one eternal being, or not being, but idea of God, right? Like, um, so salvation, three major paths to Hindu salvation include the karma marga, that's the method, uh, the way of disinterested action called bhakti marga, and the way of devotion called jhana marga. Jhana marga achieves self-realization through intuitive awareness and mystical insight. And so that's, that's kind of what I've been trying to say with not being able to say, but it's this self-realization. You're trying to come to this consciousness state, this realization state um, where um, you're seeking um, insight and, and different things and you're, you're trying to do good deeds so that you can atone for some of the negativity in your own life or, or whatever they might call that so that you can escape the reincarnation cycle, the samsara cycle, okay? Um, Bhakti Marja achieves self-realization through ritual sacrifice and discipline. So the summary of the three well-known Hindu groups in America is the first one is Ra Raj Hinism. Founder is uh, Rajneesh Chandra Mohan. He was born in 1931. He rose to fame as one of the greatest cult leaders of the last couple generations. Uh, he was a he had a master of arts. He had a he had a um, he had an education, and he was a professor at two universities. Um, later, he resigns to focus on the wish of God. Okay. 
He becomes a religious teacher, changes his name to Bhagwan, which is Hindu for God, should have been a sign. And uh, he essentially he explodes on the religious scene. He gains like over 350,000 followers, right? He moves to America in 1981 to start the first enlightened, enlightened city called Rajneesh Puram. Rajneesh Purim, it's all documented in this film that I've told you guys about, Wild Wild Country, that was located in Oregon. Like they literally, and there, there's a long story to this and we're just not gonna have time to deal with it, but he had basically, um, it was, it's kind of like a Jim Jones thing. Like he found a certain uh, allotment of land in this place in Oregon and all of his followers moved out of there. And within that township, he had more followers than they did had people and so he starts kind of like a political thing to where all his people are voting the way he wants the city to be. They, they essentially take over, right? But they have a huge campus out there and they create their own city and it's supposed to be the city of enlightenment, okay? Um, so I've already mentioned the film name, Wild Wild Country um, and, and so a bunch, you know, all kinds of strange events were taking place including some of his belief becoming public that they would become a superhuman race through their superior state of consciousness. Um, not to mention, um, they, uh, it was, I mean, it was, and I act like I, I know what hippies were like, but I mean, you see stuff on TV, I guess. I don't know, but Why are you looking it up, I, because I don't know. I assume you came from there. J John was actually in the Jesus Revolution movie. I'm just telling you. Okay. <laughs> Watch it again. You'll see. No, but yeah, but, um, like it was like free sex, like you just have sex with whoever and like you do whatever you want to do when you want to do it and all that stuff. Um, I want to read this to you real quick. Um, so Rajneesh was a self-proclaimed spiritual rebel, rebel who thrived on the controversy he created, first in India, then in America. Tal Brook, a former devotee of the popular Ind Indian guru, Sathya Sai Baba, after visiting Pune, effectively summed up the scene there. So this is the Rajneesh environment that was going on, okay? This is what he says. An object of media fascination and horror, Rajneesh is known for his bizarre revelations on sex. He's constructed a vision of the new man that repudiates all prior norms and traditions. By Rajneesh thinking, is the hedonist, or the hedonist God fully autonomous, barring the inner voice of Rajneesh, that works out really well, and free to carve out the cosmos in his own image. He is the sovereign pleasure seeker, self-transcender who owes nobody anything. The family is an anathema, children extra trash. And so long as the neo Sanyasin has the money, the fun ride continues. Afterward, however, he or she is usually a non-functional casualty. Homicides, rapes, mysterious disappearances, threats, fires, explosions, abandoned ashram, that's the temple they worship in, Children now begging in Pune streets, drug bust, all done by those amazing hybrids in red who believe they're pioneering new and daring redefinitions of the word love. Christians working in a Pune asylum confirm such accounts, adding the breakdown rate is so high the ashram has wielded political power to suppress reports. So it just kind of gives you a peek into what that environment had been like. Rajneesh had essentially made himself the main man, right? Um, it's just some teachings uh, on... Um, I'll just read you a few. There's a long list of these, but these would be some of the teachings from Rajneesh. You can be a Christ, why be a Christian? Let me be your death and resurrection. Nobody is a sinner. Even while you are in the darkest hole of your life, you are still divine. You cannot lose your divinity. I tell you, there's no need for salvation. It is within you. 
Disobedience is not a sin, but a part of growth. God is neither a he nor a she. If you say he is a she, I will say he is a he. And if you say he is a he, I will say he is a she. Whatsoever your belief is, I'm going to destroy it. Now listen to this one. If Jesus, this is what he's saying, if Jesus had a little intelligence and rationality, he would have not have gone to Jerusalem and the cross. But then there was no need for Jesus to declare that he was the Messiah and Son of God. Those messiahs are basically insane. He believed totally that crucifixion is going to prove him right. And that's why I believe there was a hidden current of suicidal intent. If anyone is responsible for the crucifixion, he himself is responsible. He asked for it. And no Jewish source or contemporary source says there was resurrection. Only the New Testament. It is fictitious. There was no resurrection. So he made this based, based upon opposition of Christianity. That's what that's yes. Called. Yes. Based, uh, in, in opposition to the Christian's idea of God. Well, specifically their idea of Jesus. Yes. It's just another document out. You have to draw you away from, yeah, yeah. This, this last one I want to read you. It's about Satan. The argument the devil gave Eve was that God wants you to remain ignorant. God is jealous. And it makes sense because the Jewish God is, a, is very jealous. He doesn't want them to become equal. This is not a loving father. Knowledge is not a sin. I counsel you to eat of the tree of knowledge. So he's teaching essentially in opposition of Christianity simply because it's not, it's not true to him. Right? But the majority, so in the same way Muslims are 90% not aggressive. Hey, so this is interesting. Uh, I was watching the UFC fight and it was in Abu Dhabi. And obviously in Abu Dhabi, the, the majority are Muslims, right? It's probably like 98% Muslim, right? And so the entire fight card had pretty much one, at least one Muslim, if not more, in almost every fight. And the main Muslim athletes, the ones that are super famous, are calling for Palestinians to stop. Stop killing innocent people, stop killing. And so it's just, it's kind of evidence to the fact that what we've already talked about, that not all Muslims are violent and aggressive. It's just a small portion of them that the majority of Muslims would tell them, hey, that's not what we should be doing, right? But in the same way, there would be a small percentage of um, Hindus, I guess, the Rajneesh, uh, Rajneesh-isms, um, in particular, that might be in opposition to Christianity. Well, I don't think, I don't think it did it like deliberately to cause conflict. I just think it was, it, I think it's interesting how just about every major religion hinges on whether or not you accept Jesus. Yeah. Well, yeah, and so I guess what's interesting is almost every single religion will will yield to the truth that Jesus was a person. Yeah. Right? Now they'll argue and that, and that's the that's the core argument that we've been focusing on as we walk through all these. Who do they believe Jesus is? And what is their authority? Right? Because that's what it comes down to. Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Right? Um, and so I think every human being has a responsibility, if anything, to try to figure that out themselves. Right? Like, look into it. Because um, Christianity, nowhere in the Bible does it talk necessarily and like, like specifically about the Hindus at that time. You know what I'm saying? But every religion talks about Jesus, right? Or at least will acknowledge that he was, if anything, at least a real person, a real person yeah. right? Okay, Harry Krishnas. These are the people, the bald-headed people with the uh, flowers, and they're in the airports and all that stuff. They uh, founded and developed from the 15th century teachings of a man named Chaitanya, I don't know, Chaitanya, who instituted worship of Vishnu as God rather than Shiva. Krishna was the supreme personality of the Godhead. 
Uh, Prabhupada, Prabhupada was born in Calcutta, India and received his calling to preach the gospel of Krishna to English speaking people in 1922. So we're just kind of looking at the origin of Hare Krishna's. How did Hare Krishna's get to America? He dies in 1977, much inner turmoil within the organization, including criminal allegations and fighting among leaders that instituted their current leader structure identified as the ISKCON or the Hare Krishnas. Um, I think they can also be, be called the Gadvidas or something. But um, And so that's kind of how you have the Hare Krishnas today, that this Prabhupada comes to America. He starts preaching the, um, the gospel of Krishna, the good news of Krishna. And um, by 19 1977, once it's kind of a, um, you know, who, who's going to take over type thing, and there was all kinds of um, issues among the leadership, and, and so they create a new leadership structure that's identified as the Hare Krishnas. Uh, they believe Krishna is the supreme being of the Godhead, and every God is an expansion of the Lord. Jesus Christ is Krishna's son but is not divine or unique to any other man that could strive to attain. So he's not, we could all become like Jesus, essentially, is what he's saying, right? Um, he was not unique in the sense that nobody else could be, uh, I'm sitting here thinking like, um, oh, um, there are Christian, there are mainstream Christian uh, pastors, Todd White, Lifestyle Christianity, okay, if y'all have heard of him. He, uh, uh, Bethel, uh, Bill Wilson, all them, they say that Jesus laid aside his deity and become a man. And so all the things that Jesus was able to do, not sin, miracles, all these things, are the same things that we can do that we can be just like Jesus was. And that's why I say when you really think about the, the idea of Hinduism and how the Eastern view of religion in general has now influenced and almost infiltrated some of traditional Christian thinkers in their own ideas of how to interpret the Bible. Does that make sense? So if you listen to Todd White, do not listen to him, okay? Um, but he will literally teach you that you can be just like, Je we can be just like Jesus. That there was nothing special about Jesus because he laid his deity aside. And because he laid his deity aside, he was just a man who God used to perform miracles and to, and to go without sin. So we can all go without sin. Okay. All right. Um, transcendental meditation. TM is what they go by. Uh, it, it's more about a spiritual practice or yoga that was introduced in Western culture by Mahesh Yogi as a religious exercise or philosophy. In a sense, that's how it's a practice they're doing to, um, to atone for their whatever you call it. I mean, they don't call it sin, but their negative actions, their negative attitudes, their whatever, right? Um, Later, he improvised it to be a non-religious psychological exercise, mainly because it wasn't necessarily getting the uh, traction within Western culture, because at that time, Western culture was a little more conservative and a little more uh, rooted in their traditional Christian views. And so it was being perceived as a, um, uh, as a threat religiously, because it came from Hinduism. Right, And so there was a lot of uh, pushback and discrepancy that took place. And so what he decided to do is uh, kind of tweak it to where it wasn't as threatening so that it was more a non-religious psychological exercise designed to relieve stress and bring peace, not peach, to inner man, which promoted the ability of in... Um, astral projection or in other words so leaving the body type experience okay to include levitation right 
And so woosaws and yogas and, you know, this meditation, you get to this state where you can actually leave your own body or even possibly levitate. And, you know, um, the Jedis in Star Wars could levitate, right? Um, and, and, and so again, you, you kind of see this influence a little bit that had come from the Hindu way of thinking that um, had influenced the um, author of Star Wars. Um, is a strong emphasis on seeking enlightenment by TM techniques. All right, I'm going to share this with you because I thought it was, uh, I feel like it kind of pulls all this together in a sense. C.S. Lewis is one of the greatest apologists of all times, uh, former atheist, became Christian. Um, he said this, at the end of all religious quest, one must choose between Hinduism and Christianity. The former absorbs all others and the latter excludes them. Hinduism would absorb all other religions. I told you guys earlier that Hindu, Hindus would say that all religions are true, that all gods are gods, They're, that doesn't bother them. The fact that you would say, well, I believe that Jesus Christ is God, they would say, okay. Like, they wouldn't have a problem with that, right? So, yeah. But if all religions are true, and our, our I don't want to call it religion, our faith system yeah. tells us that everything else is not true, wouldn't that make everything? Like, that's it, it, just a circle of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what he's saying. At the end of all religious quests, one must choose between Hinduism and Christianity. One absorbs all others, and the other excludes all others. It's, it's got to be one or the other. At the end of the day, you'd have to choose between Hinduism and Christianity. And, I mean, if anything, look at it as uh, bookends, you know. Hinduism on one end of the bookshelf, Christianity on the other uh, end of the bookshelf, right? Um, so... With that information, we can do our test on Hinduism where we have been talking about what the characteristics of a cult are and answer for ourselves. And what we see is that they deny the Trinity. They deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Or they just don't care if you think that he was. They have a belief in extra biblical revelations. Um, any leader which um, would, in a sense, not, don't think of that as, um, you know, like uh, a pastor or a priest or even uh, an apostle or a disciple, but um, kind of like a founder of the religion because they don't have necessarily like a founder of, of Hinduism. But they would say that the leaders in their religion, they claim extra biblical authority. In other words, there are certain sects of Hinduism, and it's in this book, and, and I've forgotten now what it was, you'll have to forgive me, where they have made some pro prophetic statements that have not come true, that the end of the world and different things was going to happen that didn't come true. So therefore, uh, and they have a belief in a works-based salvation, that uh, through karma, that you're in debt to your own bad actions, bad attitudes, negativity, whatever, that you are going to have to atone for those things yourself, and uh, it's most likely that won't happen in a lifetime, so therefore you will be reincarnated, and by being reincarnated, it extends um, your, your chance at reaching enlightenment, uh, the state of consciousness where you escape the cycle of reincarnation. That's the whole goal of, and and uh, Buddhism is uh, has been said, which we'll look at next week, has been said to be a break off of Hinduism. And Rajneesh, at the end of his illustrious religious career, had pretty much switched to Buddhism by the end of his his. Uh, because everything fell apart. Like he got in all kinds of trouble. There was legal problems and, and all that stuff. He, he ultimately switched to Buddhism and he claims to be Buddha. 
right and and people still following